Good afternoon, everybody. We are ready to start. I have, theoretically, I have 40 minutes. I have 39 slides. So I will do no demos, and I, um, I will probably go really quickly through each slide. So just pay attention. Uh, this is a semi-technical talk. It's not really a technical talk. It's about a little bit about process and a discussion about a concept called developer onboarding. And my name is David Bain. I'm from Jamaica. And as I said in the last presentation, I'm enjoying the weather here. I brought three jackets and I haven't had to wear any of them. It's just adding weight to my suitcase. So, everybody is good and ready? Okay, well, let's go. From zero to clone, developer onboarding, a discussion. So we're going to talk about the pain, a little background, and then the goal of, of this whole developer onboarding thing. So clone, it's easy to get started. A great system for junior developers, said no developer ever. Uh, but the, the thing about this, uh, the part of this whole thing is being approachable is a good thing, right? Um, part of the reason why babies are born with high voices and no facial hair and stuff, they're approachable. You can hold them and, you know, you want to hold them. You don't want to be that baby. <laughs> and sometimes clone feels like that baby. In fact, uh, I've had conversations with persons. I, this is a student of mine who said, I'm ready to do clone. I've, it's, you know, I've heard about it. I know you're beginning to clone. Just tell me what to do and I'll go. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, more about that. Um, some guy named Calvin said, said to me, you know, we really want senior developers. Uh, uh, we don't want to have to deal with people who are learning, you know. It's too much pain. Uh, and there's a lady who did a presentation at um, a PyCon and I think also at a Ruby event. And she's a software engineer from San Francisco. And she said, uh, there are two ways to get great engineers. You can steal them or you can make them. I'm hinting at some stuff here. Uh, so what did I say to Jason, my student who wanted to learn clone? Well, I had to show him the ugly baby and hope that after seeing the ugly baby, he'd still want to use clone. So I said, you know, think of it as learning a new operating system. It takes at least three months to become productive. Uh, it's more like operating a helicopter than a bicycle. You know, these are things you say to people so that they understand there's a journey involved and there's an ugly baby. And I actually would like to not have to say some of this stuff. In fact, as far back as 2012, uh, a clone developer named Miko Otoma, if I pronounced his name correctly, uh, he made an assessment of the things that we should be working on to improve clone. And you can take a little peek and decide how close we are to that at this point. So, so the, one of the questions I'm asking myself is, can we make getting started with clone easier for new developers? Uh, it's not going to happen by accident. And if we can do that, it's going to add a lot of value to a lot of persons. Um, firstly, the developers themselves who want to just get started and start using it, because Plone uh, does a lot of great things, but there's this barrier. Um, and to be fair, some of the barrier is the barrier is getting lower, so I'm not pretending it isn't. <clears throat> so here's a little background. 
uh, this guy named David Cadovy, he, uh, some, some blogger that I saw online, he said, if you're going to make something, then become a connoisseur of that thing. Because at, that's when you begin to understand how things affect people. And, uh, you know, if you're making cheese, you should understand what makes cheese taste good and things like that. If you're doing developer onboarding, you should start to identify what are the things that make it's easier for developers. What are the things that cause barriers? And that wasn't really my goal, but uh, I had a conversation with a WordPress designer sometime in 2013. And she said to me, how do I theme the clone site? And my thought was, that, that's easy. By then we had Diazo, you know. So there's documentation all over the internet. Just go and find it and then come back with our ready theme. It didn't quite work that way, but it was a, it was a nice thought. Um, so after I said that to her, I went and looked for the documentation because I said, all right, I'll just curate all this great documentation and I'll put it in one, one place and point, it, point her there and she'll be off to the races theming. <clears throat> what I ended up doing was something more like this. <laughs> I realized, okay, apparently there's no uh, really good documentation on how to do clone theming. And I thought, oh, well, but it's so easy. I'll just do up a document with how to do it. And this document is still uh, in complete working process, progress. Uh, but this is what I sent to her. It was just my notes about clone theming. I've, it's public online for other people who wanted to learn. And this was Plone 4 with Diazo. And thus began my journey, because I started to see uh, the ugly baby everywhere. So I started to realize, oh, wow, it's not that easy to get a build out working. It's not that easy to deploy. It's, but I was blind to that, because you see, my background is Linux system administration. So Plone is easy, right? But compare that to, say, my brother, who did computer science. I did zoology. Um, but he doesn't do Linux and stuff like that. So it's, he doesn't want to touch this stuff. Um, and so I, my goal started to become, how can I make it easier for persons who are working with Plone? And of course, there, there are lots of benefits to um, making it easier. If we start with the assumption that developers are probably the most expensive resource that you work with in terms of getting stuff built uh, and that they're generally hard to replace, then you, you want to be able to utilize your developers more, not less. You don't want to be spending lots of time onboarding. Um, you get a better return on investment, happier, more productive team members, uh, reduced turnover. I borrowed that from the Kate Heddleston engineer lady. And you can actually build trust. This is, this is something that they found in research. Uh, uh, Fagerholm et al., uh, according to them. I'll say a little more about that as we continue. So here's an interesting aside. I searched for Plone Newbie on the internet, and a funny thing happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All the top results um, were coming from my blog, which was interesting. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about good onboarding in general. Uh, this is an example of uh, typical employee onboarding. This is, funnily enough, at MIT. We're very near there now. Uh, and they have a whole suite of tools and kits just to help uh, managers to onboard staff. Uh, they have a body program, equipment and supplies information, new employee email announcement, schedule for employees first day, and then they'd have the first week, the first month, 
uh, all of this is not done by accident. They, they walk people into their jobs as opposed to what I, we tend to do, which is sink or swim. You know, we'll just hire a smart developer, we'll make them look at the code and they'll figure it out at some point. Um, but uh, good onboarding is intentional and it requires empathy. It requires understanding to some extent some of the pain that you might be blind to because you've been working with Plone for a decade. So the goal, or let's, let's talk a little bit more about developer onboarding specifically. And, and after 22 slides, it's about time to define developer onboarding. Um, it's, also, it's also known as organizational socialization, onboarding. It's the idea of turning an outsider into an insider. Uh, <clears throat> Specifically in the context of developers, you want them to be effective with the stack that they work with. And the best way to do that is help them to understand your culture, your tools, um, the required skills, and your processes. And if you do that, then you should be getting closer to success. And it's actually not as easy as I thought, because I really thought that I would have everything in place maybe after three weeks of doing this and I've been doing this since 2013 and I feel like it's still an uphill battle. Uh, by the way, here's a quick poll. How many people here feel like they're a plone insider? Okay, does that match my graph there? So. This is this this is a trick graph because I can tell you just tell you which color matches which one. <laughs> but um, generally, what I've found is that even people who have been working with Plone for a, little, a good while don't necessarily feel or they're not sure. Am I am I a Plone insider yet? Do I do I know stuff well enough? Uh, so we really should have some some goals and figure out. What are the things, what's the checklist of things that would make you a FEMA, an integrator, a developer, a core contributor, and then have uh, a checklist of things to learn and tasks to do, things to practice. <clears throat> so let's talk about the research and the practice. So basically we're talking about what's people have actually done in terms of researching developer onboarding. It turns out, in, prepar in preparing for this talk, I discovered that there is actually a gang of four for developer onboarding. But of course, that's a little bit of an inside joke, so I only saw like five people chuckle. Um, that's, that's design patterns for um, when you're coding. There's this gang of four people who have come up with a way of different pattern anyway never mind uh, and i'm also going to talk about practice which is people who are actually doing onboarding in the real world uh, very briefly so this is a gang of four um fager home sanchez guinea borenstein and munch i'm sure i'm destroying their names uh but what they did was they decided they were going to do some research on Facebook's academy, Open Academy, where what Facebook did was they brought in the core developers from different open source projects and brought them to, I think it was Stanford, and had them work with newbies to help them to get onboarded with the software. I mean, the goal was to get them able to contribute to the software. Their study was to see how effective onboarding was and what people did and what would make it better. Uh, one, one warning, it turns out that mentors become less valuable to the project while they're mentoring. So they may commit a little less code and things like that. Uh, so, so that's something to bear in mind. But look at what happens to the mentor developers. Uh, that long, the, the line at the top in the dotted blue 
uh, dashed blue is those developers that were mentored and it and as you see they they became more productive and not only more productive but also more quickly they became more productive whereas the non mentored developers yes they they did move up but they were not as productive as quickly i apologize i don't remember the metrics that they used to measure this whether it was commits or that type of thing but the general idea the general takeaway is that mentored developers do better than non-mentored developers. And they came up with recommendations. They suggested that core developers should participate in mentoring activity. Uh, there should be face-to-face -face events. Interestingly, Clone has a little bit of some of that. The Google Sum of Code provides some options for mentorship and face-to-face -face sprints do exist and they do happen. Uh, and they also warn that onboarding is not always immediately visible, so you need to kind of measure and stay engaged with the newcomers so that you can begin to see how are they progressing and so on. And what about the practice? What, what are people who are involved in this type of thing saying? Um, well, we already said that we, we, um, it produces developers faster and um, it's important that when someone is getting on board, they understand the model properly. If you don't understand the model properly, you do all sorts of strange things. In Plone, that's even more important because we're getting people who are coming from PHP, running on the file system. What is in the file system basically reflects what's coming up on the website, whereas we have things like traversal and stuff like that. We're talking about people coming from SQL databases and now they have to understand the model of an object database and things like that. Uh, in terms of the how for the developer onboarding, um, the general practice often includes some type of checklist. In fact, in the Drupal project, they have something called the Drupal ladders. Um, I don't know how active it is now, but what they do is they create checklists for different types of things that you need to get through. And I think at one point they even organized meetups where people could go through the different ladders. Um, I started something at one point, uh, which was, I can't even remember the name of it now. It was like, uh, it's not, no, not that. It was, it was, um, it was, the idea was a kind of dojo approach where um, you had some clone exercises and, all right, Today, we're going to go through installing, setting up, build up. Today, we're going to go through setting up dexterity. Here are the steps. And then people would come up and demonstrate it, almost the way that you would in a dojo, repeat, things like that. It was an idea I had, um, but I only have so many hours in the day. Uh, another common thing that I, I picked up from somebody who did Ruby on a Ruby blog is how can you simplify the setup? Um, once you get to the checklist, sometimes some of the things in the checklist can be distilled into automated steps. If you can do that, you can go faster. And a new person needs to know less to get going. Uh, Ready-made blocks are useful. So, for example, uh, we have the Diazo snippets library. So that, yes, you know Diazo, but now every time you want to do something, you have to think about it. What if we can give you a couple snippets that do common things? Uh, and the typical development cycle for a developer is they have to get their build environment, the development environment going. Then they need to customize code, test it, and then deploy it to production. This is a very simplified cycle, so please don't cringe. Uh, developers are users too, and this is why developer onboarding is important. Here's some more uh, discussion uh, by someone involved in developer onboarding or onboarding in general. Uh, in general, people don't want to think. Even developers don't want to think when they want to get started. They don't want to think about uh, whether this build out needs X, Y, Z or Z, K, H or whatever. They just want to get started and get to a hello world. 
if your hello world is taking you three hours, you may not be encouraged to continue. That, that might be considered a problem. And so uh, the whole theory around this is least amount of work as possible. Defaults should let people do less work and get more done. Uh, present features real people want. And those features happen because you do real user research. So it means you need to find out what, what do they really want. Um, and examples are always better than descriptions. So it's always better to have a simple example of how this works rather than, you know, you know, well, Diazo is this thing that is used for theming and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And 10 minutes later, you know, you need examples. Uh, and there's this concept called progressive disclosure. The idea is just show them what they need. And if they need more, there will be options. And so you, you just, just focus on progressive disclosure. And I think some of these concepts can be applied to the developer. So for example, since descriptions aren't enough, I'll soon get to an example of progressive disclosure in the context of a little more thing. But here's a quick quiz. Which part of the development cycle adds the most value? This is partially my opinion. Is it? I should have had A, B, C. <laughs> How many people say the first one? OK. How many people say the second one? It would also be interesting to know the backgrounds of these people. How many people say the third one? OK, I think we got most hands for the second one. And, and I kind of feel that the second one gives you more value because you could uh, really, most of the time, setting up a development environment is, can be distilled to an automated process. If you can put in the right scripts and everything and know the target environment, you should be able to press a button and be ready to write some code. Writing the code is added value because once you start to write code, you can bring value to your customer. Your customer can send an email. Your customer can track um, information on their website. And deploying to production obviously adds value, but if you're deploying code that doesn't do anything, then not really. So if you can automate the deploy to production, then that's great. Can you imagine um, a situation where you could get up and running and deployed in less than two hours? Like someone who knows nothing about Plone. Um, what would that look like? <clears throat> Well, here's one possible example of success. I call it Sandy's first day. Uh, so Sandy is going to have going to have to work at a Plon company, and she's never heard of Plon before in her life. Uh, but David from Alteru says Plon is the greatest thing ever. So she frantically, the week before, decides she's going to find out about Plon. So after having breakfast and everything, 10 o'clock in the morning, she Googles for Plone and she finds the Plone Newbie Developer Guide. 10.01, she happens to be running a, a Linux box. So uh, that's convenient. So she runs pip install uh, pluck. And then she runs this little pluck recipe and she launches her Plone site 10 minutes past 10. Uh, then at 10.40, she sets up a fat theme from a repository of a couple of sample themes, and she customizes some content types with um, dexterity and stuff like that. And she customizes the theme a little bit more because she read about the gloss rules that are available on it. And by 11.15, less than two hours, she runs plot deploy and she points it at a digital ocean server and she has a live site now that would be great so here are some of the tools i've picked for making that happen uh plot because it is really 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 
did I mention really easy to get started um, there's some there's some gaps in documentation and there's some non-standard things but those could be changed uh, Mr. Bob allows you to create some nice templates so if she was working with a particular company you could create templates to get started what would be great is some type of merge between plot Mr. Bob and those Ansible rules because then you'd be able to do that plot deploy thing which doesn't really exist yet. Uh, there are resources now like trainingplone.org so there would be a quick quick start tutorial that she would have found and Gloss is like a layer on top of the ASO which is like what Bootstrap is to layouts use CSS classes instead of the ASO rules to, to do your layout. Uh, and if you actually need to dig into Diazo, there's a Diazo snippets library. So after a day, she should be able to do quite a bit. Um, the, the whole idea behind this, uh, so, uh, or one of the things that I, I think when I'm thinking about this stuff is, what's the least amount of vocabulary needed to get stuff done? In other words, do they have to know the words Diazo, Mosaic, Build Out, um, Pip, uh, and then study to be able to pass an exam and know all these things or can they just learn a few commands and use things they already know and be productive so in conclusion I don't know if you know about this guy this is a good example of getting the model wrong so apparently this guy didn't realize that the war was over he didn't realize for a couple of years like i think it could have been 10 15 years so he was in the jungles in the philippines and he actually killed some people who came into the jungle um, when they dropped flyers to tell him that the war was over he thought it was a ploy by the enemy uh, and he subsisted on coconuts and stuff like that all those years. His commanders gave him the instruction that he should not surrender, he should not die by his own hand, and he faithfully followed all of that. Eventually, they managed to convince him that the war was over uh, without him killing them, <laughs> and, and he got out. <laughs> um, he, he, he returned to Japan, and he, he started... Um, uh, was, did he or did he go to Brazil? I don't. I don't want to give the details wrong. But the summary is when you when you have the model wrong, when you when someone isn't properly onboarded, we can lose a lot of time, because the way that they think about the problems are, are wrong. You know, somebody who's coming to this is starting to say, "Well, is the SQL server running? Um, what version of PHP are you running?" Uh, you know, and, and so you can literally have a developer working for three months and not be productive because they haven't gotten the benefit of understanding the pieces. So I think in conclusion, it's important that one of our investments in developer onboarding is getting the model right. These are some references. So uh, most of the things I've spoken about once this talk is available, you can get the references. And thank you. Are there any questions? <clears throat> Comments? Thoughts? Right, now that I understand Rapido, I think it's great. <laughs> Um, and it's actually easy. I think, I, I was thinking, in fact, there's, there's somebody that I know who is coming from PHP and they found their way to Web2Pi and they kind of like it. And they've, they've been somewhat productive in it. And I started thinking, well, that might be a faster way to get them productive in Plone with something like Rapido. Uh, so 
it's something that I'm actually looking into. I, I, I want to kind of explore how far you can go with it before you have to start doing browser views and other things, but I like it. Because, yeah, because you can undercut all of this. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. And so, so I'm, I'm, I have started to use Rapido, not, not anything big, just needed to put announcements at, in the header of, of, of a site. So we just use Rapido with a Diazo rule to inject an announcement onto our page. And it means in terms of maintenance, uh, I can quickly show somebody and say, they're in the theme, you can change this and it will change the announcement. If you want to switch off the announcement, just edit the HTML and it's fairly maintainable. So I like that, yeah. Okay, that means everybody is ready to go to the next talk. <laughs> Sandy's first day. Sandy, yeah. Uh, that was all through the web the stuff she did, digging through, and, and how, how could you, I, th I think at some point you reached that point that, that learning curve, uh, it's, it's not like this, it's not a wall, but right, it's yeah. going to be high, and we yeah. have to improve the through the web story quite a lot, but at some point, uh, there's a threshold. She wants to do stuff on the top. Right. Yeah, we we bomb <coughs> templates clone and stuff is there, but the step that you have to be through that once the environment is set up is so extremely complex. How, extremely how complex and changing also. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're taking away the bad stuff. Like I know, I know, I know. Like I know. Uh, it's, it's, it's still a lot. Uh, do you have any ideas how to make up onboarding? Do you think onboarding should always go that way, that you give a, uh, the feeling of success to people who are new by let it, letting them do stuff through the web, like you suggested, and then telling them, okay, if you want to step further, you have to learn about ZCML, uh, Python, yeah, page yeah. templates, Chameleon, yeah. uh, and how to tie this all together? Yeah, um, I think there's, a, there's value in pain. <laughs> So, so let them enjoy the through the web and get as far as they can with through the web, and then just enough pain with enough of a goal. If they can get past that, then they'll be fine with the rest of it. But if there is zero success uh, after the first two weeks, in fact, I had a conversation recently with someone who's a .NET developer, and I've. Up to that time, I was saying, yeah, productive in Plone is about three months. And you just accept that and you invest the time and get someone up to speed. So I said, I asked him, how much how much time does it take for, for your guys to get going? And he's like, oh, what? They have to get ready on the first day. You know? What are you talking about? That's Jamaican. That's <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, so, you know, there... So then I started thinking, whoa, <laughs> these guys expect somebody who doesn't even know the stack to be able to do something useful in the first day. And I'm telling people that we're spending money on interns who won't be productive for the first three months. And I had to step back and think, okay, maybe I need to review. Maybe Rapido is a good thing. And yeah. So, so that's that's part of my perspective. Okay, thank you again.